SFU Vancouver, the Center for Dialogue, and the SFU City Program. And we also want to acknowledge that this event is taking place on unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish uh, peoples, the Squamish, the Musqueam, and the Salish Alpine Nations. Well, normally I would say that this is a really formal looking uh, uh, setting because the rooms that we usually use at uh, Harbor Center are very formal, but this is as informal as it gets, right? First of all, who has not been to a city conversation before? Show me, show me some hands. Fabulous. Okay, that's what we were hoping. That's why we're doing this here. Um, so let me explain how this works. We have, we don't have speakers and we don't have an audience. What we have are presenters and participants, and you guys are the participants. Okay? So the point is to have a conversation. Our presenters are going to talk for just a maximum of seven minutes a piece, and we've got a book to pull them off as they go over. And, uh, and but most of the time, Three quarters of the entire hour is really devoted to your questions, but also not just questions, but your observations, your opinion, because it's a conversation. It's not just a one-way communication. Uh, I also don't have to say that it's not routine to lunch because uh, we're not at lunch time and it is definitely not routine to eat some of the fabulous food from uh, this coffee. Okay. If you are tweeting, it's hashtag CityCom, C-O-M-B. If you uh, are not on our uh, email list, please sign up. It's over there at the end of this uh, table. You can sign up at any, at any point uh, now or later uh, after, the, uh, after the event. And we'll keep you informed. We've got some really interesting uh, events uh, coming up. But today, we're going to talk about the housing crunch. Millennials might solutions. We're examining the region's most pressing issue, the lack of affordable housing. Our presenters are Tessica Fong, Veronica Maliki, uh, who are the founders of City High, an organization that harnesses your energy, your experiences, and your passion to solve real urban challenges and amplifies the voice of the new generation in Vancouver. I'm the old generation. Anybody else? Yeah, there's a, there, are a couple, there are a couple of gray hairs around here. We're on our way out. You're taking over, right? It's your job to do a better job than we've done. Okay? What we have is a housing crunch, not a housing crisis. A crisis is what happened in, in uh, uh, Houston. A crisis is what may be happening in uh, southern Florida. But we have a crunch, and we are not unique in Vancouver. Because this is a crunch that every city on the west coast of North America is facing. Right? I heard the same problems when I was in San Francisco a couple of weeks ago, the same problems when I was in uh, uh, Portland, the same problems in, uh, in Seattle, the same problems in Los Angeles, the same problems in, uh, in, in San Diego. Everybody's complaining about this. But some places are finding better solutions than others. Uh, uh, Seattle is one. But we tend to be leaders on these things. 
and today we're going to hear from some real leaders. Joining uh, Jessica and Veronica is Caitlin McDougall, who is the Public Engagement Coordinator at the City of New West. Uh, and she's got a broader picture of, uh, of how a new generation can, uh, can address and support civic uh, priorities. So we'll start with the housing crunch, but we're going to broaden it uh, from there. And now, So that's where the 30 Network comes in. And the 30 Network is a pop-up think tank, a pop-up think and do tank, uh, where we brought 30 people under 30 to work together on co-creating housing solutions for the city. And so we organized this, it took place from uh, in the spring of uh, this year. Um, and uh, we had uh, over 100 different applications from young people across the city who really wanted to engage in this process and ultimately collected 30 amazing um, individuals um, who are all from very diverse backgrounds. And that was really important to us because we didn't want to bring together 30 housing policy experts or 30 urban planning nerds, um, although we did have some. Um, and, uh, and because if uh, bringing together 30 housing policy experts could have solved the housing crisis, then it already would have. And so the idea was to bring together people who are artists, people who uh, are engineers, people who work in health, um, and who have all different interests and backgrounds, 
work together from their different perspectives to create um, different out-of-the-box solutions. So not only did we convene in a group of 30, but we also looked at an ecosystem of figuring out who were the other players that were involved, and we engaged them in those conversations so that they could help us shape the 30 network process, um, but also help us explore and co-owners of this project um, after the process. So um, we had amazing partners in that city, Centers for People, McConnell, and these groups did just help in terms of financial support, but also in helping frame the contracts, providing support, providing expertise, um, and sharing that knowledge with uh, our third network. All right, so what did it actually look like? Um, so it happened over four different sessions, and we had a four-step process. Um, and it followed a really easy acronym to remember, A, B, C, D. So the first step was A, where are we at? So we had um, experts coming in, who, uh, come in who worked uh, who work in the housing sector and who worked in the housing sector for many years um, for them to talk about what they thought are the spheres of influence right now, what work in this group of 30 really have an impact, um, and what was already happening so we weren't reinventing the wheel. The next step was B, so where do we want to be? Um, and that was both co-creating a vision for um, where we wanted to be um, 30 years from now, and what are some values that the um, housing in Vancouver should have. The next step was C. So uh, what do we want to create to get there? So after talking about where we're at and where we want to be, we have this creative tension that was set up. But how do we actually work together to get there? And that's where we had um, the 30 all together. We're ideating. Um, we used hundreds of stickies and should have thought about getting uh, a sponsorship from Post-it notes beforehand, but we'll remember that for next time. But we used hundreds of stickies to ideate all these different ideas, um, and then 30 worked together to distill them down into some core ideas that could, uh, could be followed. And then D was how do we deliver it, so actually working in teams to co-create projects together. So from the, that group of 30, six teams were formed that worked on different projects. And so we wanted to help them launch those projects. And so we had a huge event called the Creative Day, uh, Millennials creative, uh, creating creative solutions to the housing crisis. Um, and so each team had a, uh, an opportunity to present their projects. Um, and there were judges from the community and from our partners that helped them give feedback on those projects for them. Also, um, uh, there was a, a pool of seed funding, so we were able to fund two of the projects, and so that came from collectively both the judges' votes and then also the people's votes. So um, both of those were compounded together to select two teams um, that were awarded the funding. So the two teams were Empty Nest and Queen Pop. And I'll turn it over to Barry to tell them about the Yes, so really briefly, the six projects. The first one was um, Empty Nest, and that's a paired living program. Um, so a program that pairs empty nesters or seniors who have empty bedrooms um, at home and want to age in place with younger people, perhaps students, that are looking for more affordable housing. So you're kind of filling two grades with one stone. One is, the, um, is having more affordable housing options, um, and then the other is social isolation, which is a huge issue among seniors. Um, the next one, where is the housing, was about staging big, uh, poppy uh, public events um, that would engage young people in housing issues, so staging things um, in plazas and having different art, uh, art displays. Uh, platform was sort of like an Airbnb, but for um, the uh, creatives, so people who are artists, people who work in that those industries, um, and who roam between a few different cities and have smaller contracts to be able to keep their um, pieces and to be able to sublet easily. Um, housing 50 YBR was about creating um, 50 tangible actions that young people can take to help in the housing crunch. Um, so really creating bite-sized actual pieces. Community pop um, was Caitlin's project. Um, and that was about using um, unused land um, or underutilized land to create pop-up housing, so housing like tiny homes. Um, and lastly, Housed Up was about creating a platform for renters to, cre uh, to connect um, and build trust with landlords. So really, this was an experiment of community building, bringing together pretty people, um, and from that process, we learned a lot about you know what are, what are some of the successes and failures, and, and um, I think in terms of the, the thirty pod, or sorry, the six projects and the thirty, um, they're all at various stages, and, and we can talk a little bit more about that during the question next. Um, but I think what we found were big lessons was around um, spending more time on the development of the project and, and some of the challenges around being able to support the projects after. 
process, um, both in terms of financial resources, but also in terms of um, institutional support and making those happen. Um, in terms of the successes and what we found uh, was really a, a great learning piece and what we might move forward with was that community building aspect, building that network of 30 people from a whole bunch of different backgrounds and connecting them with um, folks in the industry that are working on these issues. Um, but also starting to shape the narrative and to shift that narrative um, from young people being victims um, to them also being leaders and, and co-creating solutions in the space. Um, and so building on this work, we've now continued to work with Jen Sweets, which was one of our big partners um, in putting the 30 Network on. Um, but they're really helping in, in doing research about uh, what the landscape is. That this is not just an issue, as Michael mentioned at the beginning, that's just happening in Vancouver, it's happening in Toronto, it's happening in Montreal, and, and it's much more a systemic issue across the nation. And so um, Generation Sweets kind of talks about how our generation is squeezed, you know, not just in terms of uh, when you're graduating, if you're graduating um, and making less money to find a job than your parents on average. Um, you're graduating with more student debt and things are costing more on average, um, both in terms of housing, and transportation, and childcare. So that's really that shift, triple squeeze. And I think it's a really important thing to recognize that it's not an individual failure of individuals, um, but that it's a systemic solution that we're not setting up young Canadians to do well in our future. Um, and so that's kind of the work that we've been doing in terms of Code Red. So Code Red is Jen Squeeze's um, initiative around housing. So, uh, what we're doing in Metro Vancouver is getting more young people engaged in housing issues. Um, and so there's a number of different stats that have come out as well out of Paul Kirchhoff's lab, which is um, kind of the foundation of a lot of the uh, research that um, guides and propels Generation Squeeze. Um, so, for example, in 1976, so um, uh, in 1976, half a million dollars could get you two houses, um, and nowadays it can get you a two-bedroom house, if that. Um, and also in 1976, it would take five years to um, save five years of full-time work to save for 20% down payment on a home, um, and now um, it takes about 27 years of full-time work. Some really staggering and just mind-blowing numbers. So in terms of Code Red's approach, and I think how that might fit as well into the 30 network, um, is that Code Red takes a long-term approach in terms of policy. So one, it's a three-pronged approach. One is reducing harmful um, demand. So that's looking at how housing is being used currently as investment, as opposed to um, housing just for homes. And so they have a principle called um, homes first, investment second. The second piece is about increasing supply. So adequate supply and affordable supply um, so that people actually have enough access because there is an increasing population and increasing demand for um, supply. And then the third is also taxing housing wealth um, fairly. So that's going to go that uplift tax, um, but also making sure that basically revenue is generated um, from housing is also then shared to all of us that are having this housing crisis. Um, and so in terms of the context and how this fits, I think the work that the 30 Network is doing is alleviating like, an immediate pain point. So looking at what are some of the short-term solutions um, that can really help the challenges that are happening now. Um, but I think that needs to also happen at the same time when we're looking at long-term policy change that will take longer um, to implement, but we need to be pushing on both ends to figure out not just you know whose other whose organization is to blame, but also how we can really internalize and figure out what role we can play um, in making sure that we're not contributing to the housing crisis, but also that we can help take leadership on it. So in short, with City Hive, our core, the core of our mission is to transform the way that young people are engaged in cities. And what we're, we're really excited about is this idea of the triple win. So how do we not only meaningfully engage youth, um, but also at the same time tackle these big, messy, um, and overwhelming city challenges and create solutions for organizations, for cities, and the community at large, and also model what meaningful community engagement looks like. And so the 30 Network in itself was sort of an experiment for what that could look like. Um, and it's something that we've learned from and that we have lessons carrying forward. Um, but we think that the 30 Network and other ideas and projects that we have um, can really be a model for that triple win. And the core philosophy behind the work that we do is that we think that youth are the, the largest untapped resource in the city. You know, our energy, our passion, our time isn't really being uh, invited to be to, to be able to dedicate that time, and I think we're trying to help build those bridges and bridge extend that hand of invitation so that young people feel like there is a way.
good enough to deal with the issues, the challenges that are so impactful, not just to them, but also their communities. Um, and then also create solutions and help institutions that are struggling and wrestling and taking a lot of leadership in their communities to take on these onerous social issues. And so some of the things that we're working on now, um, a chunk of our work is working with organizations, cities on creating youth engagement strategies. Another bucket of work is actually implementing that youth engagement. Um, and then another realm of work is uh, youth hubs. So creating working groups and teams and bringing youth together, convening them to work on specific challenges like housing, but also public spaces and uh, transportation and other city issues. So if you're interested in getting involved or want to stay in touch, please do. Um, and otherwise, we're looking forward to having a conversation together. We're just going to take one minute to try and make it so more people can hear. So just give us one second. This is Amy McDougall, and as mentioned, I was part of uh, City Hives 30 Network. It's a phenomenal experience, so I would highly recommend getting engaged with them in any future activities that you can. A promo right there. Uh, not that you need it. Um, but I'm actually going to maybe try to widen the conversation a little bit to a bit of a regional discussion uh, around housing affordability and youth engagement. So just as a little bit of context um, and background, as you might know, Metro Vancouver's success is a livable region um, has really been built and founded upon the long-standing cities in the sea of green vision, uh, which has really promoted sustainability and livability in the lower mainland since the 1960s. The 1960s. Um, but something that I'm interested in is how um, these goals of livability and sustainability are kind of coming to head with some major problems and maybe need to be uh, rethought and kind of reinvented a little bit. Um, so for example, uh, you know, the region is facing a lot of rapid urban development that's causing pressure on agricultural lands and industrial lands. Um, spatial inequities are frustrated um, by the rising cost of housing, and many individuals and communities are facing displacement um, in the current housing crisis. So these are problems that uh, our region needs to tackle as a region, I believe. And moreover, a new generation of regional leaders is coming into power uh, at a time when pressure to tackle these issues is very high. Um, so I think there's really a, a role that young people can play in uh, revisiting and reinterpreting this uh, this vision and these values specifically. So, sorry, let me go ahead and third arm. Okay, there we go. Um, so something that I'm working on uh, with some folks is called a new group called the Next Generation of Regional Leaders. Um, and really we have three kind of main objectives, which is to revisit, uh, reinterpret, and renew um, some energy and focus around Metro Vancouver uh, and regional vision and the regional vision uh, by building intergenerational uh, connections between uh, young champions of the region as well as the predecessors of people who are uh, maybe retiring and moving on and having some strategic discussions about how we can um, better understand each other as different uh, generations. Um, also, uh, to kind of help uh, reinterpret by uh, looking at what the needs of today and tomorrow are, thinking about what we've done well, but maybe how we need to tweak these uh, things that we've got a lot of praise for to be even better, as Michael kind of mentioned at the beginning, it's our job to do a better job uh, than the people before us. Uh, I think, as I mentioned, you know, the region has got a lot of praise for these things, both locally, nationally, internationally, um, you know, won many sustainability awards and there's praise of, you know, Vancouver, Metro Vancouver is such a livable place, which is great. Um, but I think at the same time, while achieving these things, it's, uh, it hasn't benefited everybody equally, specifically people of uh, my generation, which may be having a hard time getting into the housing market or feeling uh, displaced or under a crunch. Um, and so recently we surveyed our, our membership, uh, which is mostly people uh, in the age of 20 to uh, 40. And we found that uh, most people thought that the goals and strategies of the region really needed to do a better job at encompassing things like housing affordability, um, happiness and well-being, and social justice and equity. And I think that really, again, fits into this discussion about uh, housing affordability and the housing crisis. Sorry. And so I think just to kind of reiterate then, if we're going to modernize what livability and sustainability means, uh, we need to have this intergenerational discussion to help share knowledge from the predecessors, but modernize uh, the context for the people who are going to be living here as we move forward. So just, uh, just to give a little bit of context about kind of why I think the regional discussion is important around housing affordability. 
Um, so a lot of focus is, I think, focused on local, provincial, or federal government, and rightly so, in creating housing affordability solutions, but I think the region also plays a really uh, important role. So maybe just by a quick show of hands, uh, how many people here think that it's more affordable to kind of live on the outskirts of Metro Vancouver or in the suburbs? Okay, we have a couple of votes, and yeah, I think I think there's a lot of people who think that, and uh, you know, to a degree, maybe it's true if we look just at the cost of housing. Um, but what we can actually see uh, on this slide, for example, and yeah, so what we see on this slide is that you know, uh, housing. Oh, I think this is looking at single family homes. Um, homes to the west are over one million dollars, and as we get further east and south, um, we find things a little bit more affordable. But I'm done. Uh, Actually, if you incorporate the house, uh, the cost of transportation, quickly things become a lot more uh, less affordable for those people. And this is a, really then a discussion about transportation and housing as a regional issue. How we encompass and incorporate these two things, uh, which are very important, being land use and transportation, to address afford a housing affordability has to be discussed at a regional level because these impacts are. Um, connected and we need to discuss them that way. So I think um, this is some research that was done by Andy Yan, uh, I think in 2016, and so you know, he did some uh, really great um, you know, looking over census data to basically uh, incorporate the cost of housing uh, with the cost of transportation. And so what he found, for example, uh, is that if you look at uh, over 25 years, residents in the township of Langley spent over $500,000 on transportation compared to $300,000 in Vancouver. So that's about a $200,000 difference. And so therefore, uh, in Langley, uh, with the steep transportation costs combined with the cost of housing, uh, means that about 73% uh, of the single family homes are now over the $1 million mark. And this is probably even more so uh, now because the cost of housing is even lower since this research. So. Uh, I think just to kind of reiterate and kind of conclude that, you know, this demonstrates two important things to me. One, that solutions need to be coordinated at a regional level, and two, that issues need to be tackled and coordinated in effect. And then I'm just going to quickly kind of conclude uh, on why I think youth engagement is important uh, on regional issues. So, uh, I think, you know, as Ron and Tesca highlighted, a lot of people have heard this, and a lot of people believe that, you know, uh, you know, there's a lot of negative rhetoric about millennials and, and young people, you know, that we're lazy, that we're entitled, we're apathetic, yet over opinionated. Um, this is one that I kind of love to hate, you know, that avocados are the, you know, biggest number one problem that we face. And I, you know, these things I think are important to have in the youth engagement discussion because uh, I think they're meant to actually deter us from taking action and they're meant to deter us from doing the things that we want to do, but they're also just flat out wrong um, because really our generation um, is engaged we are at the front of these conversations uh, we are doing things it's the new norm for us to be a very engaged group of people we have the most access to um, communication and uh, integration than probably generations before us and uh, we're working together and we're constantly in contact we're at the front of these discussions and, and I think that rhetoric needs to be combated by the fact that we are demonstrating and doing and showing that um, you know we are at the front of these conversations and that we can be leaders and that um, we're out there doing these things. You know, Tessa and Ron are a great example of that. I'm sure there's people in this room who are a great example of that. Um, but really, that rhetoric needs to be combated by us continuing to do and act and demonstrate that um, we are the future and that we need to be part of these discussions. So. Yeah, I'll leave it at that because I'm getting the time's up sign. Um, we don't live in a, in a vacuum here. Uh, there are institutions of government, of business, of, of education, all of those things. How do we, how do we get change uh, out there? question, I think that's something that we've been sitting a lot with as well, realizing what are the limitations and what we need to do. I think to Caitlin's point then, like that's why we need to work together across generations because I think there's a, an energy and a passion and excitement to new ideas that youth can bring. And then on the flip side, we also need that experience. We need people that are in places of power to be listening and to be creating spaces at the tables that 
young people can, but also help become decision makers. And so that's really why we've been working with Gen Studies, because they are working um, to create advocacy, organizing body for folks in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, because we don't have that. And that's how our government works. We need people lobbying for us on our behalf. Um, that's how industry does it, that's how seniors do it, and that's how they get change to happen. And there's no one really um, currently in that space that's lobbying for folks in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. And so you wonder why you know, we are in the situation that we're in. Um, and I think it's really important to recognize that it isn't an individual failure, it's really a systematic issue. So that's why when I was sharing a bit more about Generation Squeeze's three pronged approach, it's, there's no one blanket solution, there's no one bullet solution to you know, looking at, at how we solve the affordability crisis. It's really looking at one, how do we reduce harmful demand? And that's like separate from whether it's foreign or local investment. I think we need to look at how investment is really damaging and, and displacing people that want to love work, live in play here in Vancouver, um, or in whatever city where the housing crisis is happening. On the flip side, we also need to build more supplies. We know more people are coming here. There's already a shortage. And so if we're thinking long term, we need to figure out how we can build that adequate supply, and not just supply that at market prices, but that's also affordable for folks. Um, and then thirdly, we need to look at if there are big, there are huge windfalls in terms of who, who's you know, winning at the housing game and who's losing the housing game. And that's further perpetuating intergenerational social economic class um, inequity. And so we need to look at how we can use taxes to be able to help reallocate and, um, and really not just have sole, single people privatizing those, those gains, those capital gains and those windfall gains, but also making sure that that is shared and, and um, that we can give back towards yeah, just to quickly add, I think two things that uh, maybe need to be done because I think our public institutions do lead really well, and um, they're just sometimes maybe a bit slow moving, and uh, and that's okay because you know that makes sure that there's due process and that there's you know different people are heard, and there's there's some okay reasons why that is, but I think. Um, two things need to happen. One, more young people need to be hired in, into government and in government positions so that they can bring these innovative ideas, uh, knowledge of new technologies uh, into these spaces and be pushing the way um, young folks are brought into the discussion and, and diverse groups are brought into the discussion as well. Uh, the other thing, while that uh, happens, while young people get hopefully hired into these positions and have these new opportunities, uh, I think we need to push these institutions into that place and push that as a value, uh, that's something, uh, because it might not just happen naturally, right? We need to be kind of uh, pushing them along from that public just perspective. So talking to um, civic leaders, encouraging them that like, this is a priority, we are engaged, This is a, these are election issues, um, and demonstrating that so that the institutions start to realize that way. also why at City High our, our mission is really to transform those systems of engagement. Because I don't think it's that young people aren't showing up, it's that those processes were designed for an age and a time where we don't really fit, we don't really engage in that way anymore. And so it's time for those systems to also shift. So they're, they're matching the ways that we're engaging. And I think we can help lead in those conversations, but we also need, like, it's not enough for us to be kind of reaching out. I think organizations and institutions need to also reach back and to offer those invitations those are the places where the power is, and that's where decisions are being made. And we are disproportionately being affected by those decisions while also not being at the table. So that's why it's an intergenerational justice issue that we have here. And and I think that I'm preaching to the choir because you're all here. <laughs> you're, you're all very well aware, well, well aware of the issues. Um, but I think it's something to consider of in, in the work that you're doing um, and, and whatever organization that you're part of. Okay. Who else? Yes. Yeah, I'd like to make two points. Um, first of all, um, I used to work for Canada's housing agency at the university. And uh, at the time that I, that I was there, the federal government decided to stop funding social and co op housing because of the long term debt that was created. And so that money would have been passed to the government and um, they would work for the so this is really the end of the result of stopping And uh, I guess the second point for is that uh, I'm finding uh, I'm in the same place with the native farmers who have been hired on very inadequate income 
that we cannot find affordable housing, and there's a lot of time for that. So it seems to me that we need to be some point in either joining that together. And, uh, but I think the chances of their institute more funding on the federal level that we talk to the bodies is very um, limited. Can you summarize what was said during the hearing? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, there are issues with with uh, you know, with elderly people who also can't afford uh, uh, housing and are having similar difficulties. So perhaps it's an opportunity for. Uh, generations to join together to deal with these issues. And then a uh, question of where the funding comes from. There used to be funding from the federal government that, uh, catch me if yeah, they, they funded social housing and co-op housing and it created long-term care. And as a result, they stopped funding for people. And so uh, the federal There was funding for social housing, for co-op housing, uh, but that has stopped. Can we get that back? Uh, how would we? Uh, how would we get that back? Uh, I think it's a very important point to say. That one of the challenges in housing is that it's such a, there's different levels of jurisdiction that are involved, and so the provincial level, the Rental Tenancy Act, is really relevant. At the federal level, as you mentioned, with that co-op funding, and social funding that we get cut. And I know that they are working on creating a new national Canadian housing strategy, but the timeline for that is six months for a process, and then there's recommendations. And so that's why we were talking about these solutions now, not six months, not two years from now, because our generation millennials will be leaving the city, and families won't be able to live in there. And it's changing the way that people are deciding whether to have kids or whether um, you know to stay in the city where they grew up and whether they belong. So I think there's a lot of concern on that. I think that for advocacy is needed also at the national level, at the provincial level. I think there's a lot of tension in pushing at the municipal level, um, but municipalities have very limited um, leverage, and I think many cities are taking as much leadership as, as they can, um, some less, more or less. Um, but uh, but I think they also have limited leverage on what they can actually um, act on. Yeah. Um. Two, two points, similar points. I live in one of those co-ops, um, just moved in. And uh, the, the federal funding and planning for funding has been quit. So has uh, the C the, the, we bought out from the CMHC loan. It is to say that there are structures of governance on land and housing that can work without the funding. We're funding ourselves right now. So it, it's, it's not, and it's portable. Um, what was required was some financial intelligence way back at the beginning, and uh, that's that's a bit of a crapshoot. Um, my my second point though is I'm 42, and I find myself left out of your discussion. Uh, I'm not under 40, and I'm, I'm not. I, and this is an important thing for me because I've lived in Vancouver my entire life, and I've watched these houses not not go out of reach. They were out of reach when I was 15, so I've been youth. I've been told that I was youth. Um, I've been told that I I was the one that needed to get engaged. I would invite you to consider that the rhetoric of youth versus older generations, while important in illustrating some really key metrics, might also have a dark side that gets in the way that allows people to actually discount you. There are people my age with families that are experiencing this crunch. I, I fear every month about whether or not a year from now I'm going to be able to like, there are lots of creative people older than me that have been engaged in this work, and I don't see a solution happening in, in the granted immediate solution. Yeah, but that's that's a complex field and stuff. But we're going to look at systemic change. This work needs to involve people right up and down the age chain, and I, I just the, the language might need to change in order to avoid that. Yeah, so just to quickly reiterate, like, the language of youth can sometimes actually alienate some people who uh, maybe fall in between different generations, and uh, how we kind of uh, frame the discussion is a really important thing. Uh, and I would 100% agree with you. So, for example, uh, just a really quick example, originally we were going to call our group uh, the like, Young Leaders of the Region. 
And I quickly realized that, okay, there's actually a, a lot of people kind of 35, 45, to that, in that age range who, you know, are still really important to this discussion. And so we rebranded it and kind of reframed it as the next generation of regional leaders because we thought that was a bit more inclusive. And I, you know, I think you're completely right. And, you know, there's a really great um, like YouTube video from that guy, Adam Williams Everything, on like why millennials don't exist. You know, it's a branding term, right? And again, like I think these things, like, while, okay, it helps us kind of categorize people and understand their certain things, you know, it's also, uh, yeah, I agree, it's used to kind of uh, alienate us in some ways sometimes. So that's why, uh, in my work, the intergenerational component is so, so important, right? It has to be there, because if it's just one group or just the other group, yeah, you're not, I don't think we're going to be as effective as advancing solutions. So, 100% agree, yeah. I completely agree that intergenerationality is so important this and like you were saying, um, and I think it's kind of our mentality around the 30 network as well is that we didn't imagine that we were going to have young people coming in and all of a sudden thinking of things that hadn't been thought of by other people in the past or that um, were better than what had already been thought of in the past with, without thinking about all of those things. So it's really important <laughs> to think about, to really learn from what was already happening. And there are people who have been working in housing in Vancouver for decades and who are real experts and really understand the issues, so absolutely we need to be working together. Um, I think one thing too though, and this is something that came up when we were creating City High, and my mom even said, like, what about me? Like, you're not, yeah. not going to be advocating for me. And uh, so I've had really interesting discussions about this in the past too. Um, and I think this is also the nature of a lot of movements that advocate for certain groups of people that automatically other groups of people feel like they're excluded fairly and justly so I think a lot of the time. Um, but also when there's voices that aren't spoken for, sometimes it does need to be that voice that speaks through those particular voices. It's something that we're really um, uh, that's really important to us is that it's not us versus anybody else ever, but it's always us with and learning from others. Um, so and one of the solutions that then came was empty net and that really highlighted a challenge because not just people that you know don't yet have access to housing, it's also folks who have housing and then are hoping to age in place but then are no longer able to. And so trying to figure out what some intergenerational sort of solutions can be where if you're pairing people you know, that are looking for a form of affordable housing with folks whose families have left them and have aged and they want to stay in the same neighborhood, they're very used to where they're living and how can we actually create affordable housing and create you know, elder care and intergenerational sources and building those factors. So that was one of the discussions that really resonated with the public and with the judges as well. Um, but I think there's many, many more solutions that we can think of that are not just wins just for the same generation, but I think are wins for the community abroad. Okay, just one comment about that. People of my age disproportionately vote more often than people of Jessica's age, and elected representatives respond to the people who vote disproportionately to the, pe uh, to the people who don't vote. So voting is critical. The 18 to 35 year uh, bracket has about 28% of people voting. It's about half of people my age. Why do you think elected representatives who are elected to represent the people who vote disproportionately favor the people of my age? Get out. There's by elections essentially a referendum on housing, so vote. Um, but I think the other thing to point out is that people who own homes are way more likely to vote than people who rent. And to my mind, the generational, like what generation, what stage and age is a correlated factor, but not the causal factor of our crisis. The causal factor is that people who own homes, and more specifically own land, are getting richer, while people who rent are getting poorer. And they're doing that because of factors that are out of their control as a homeowner, but nonetheless they're benefiting by these massive, massive windfalls of equity. And as not as young people, but as people who don't own homes, 
they, us, need to take back some of that equity and invest it into building affordable rental stock. I would think of uh, Vancouver among generations. Uh, if about its size, did I have that right? About its size and about where it's and where it's going. Uh, yes, definitely there is. One of my best and longest friends, uh, in just since I've known her for the longest in my life, is uh, 88 years old and she lives in the west side of Vancouver, kind of over here UBC. And when I meet up with her, she constantly is talking about, ah, I was downtown, you know, and the growth and all those things. And, you know, remembers a polite, quaint version of Vancouver uh, that's maybe not gone. And, and, and that's fair, like, that's what she experienced, that's what she grew up with, that's what she was raised in, right? You can't take that away from somebody, you can't take their values away from them. And that's again, why I think shifting back to that intergenerational discussion is important, right? Because I have different values and I have different beliefs of what a city or what a region should look like. And how do we know uh, if we don't start discussing with each other, right? But I mean, I, I definitely think that, yeah, they, there's going to be differences. People, uh, new generations tend to have different ideas about how to do things, and that's, that's okay. And that's, how society progresses and how we change and how we grow, but there's those tensions that, that need to be worked out. So. Absolutely. I think Vancouver is a city in its awkward teenage years that it's experiencing this growth, this growth, these growing pain, I think. And if we look around the world, there are other cities that have gone through this and then had to you know, fight and had to difficult challenges that we're not facing. So I think First off, there's a lot that we can learn from other cities in the world and what they've done to shift. Um, I guess my biggest fear is that this city is becoming a city for those who can afford it and those who serve those who can afford it. And I fear that there's a lot of our wealth. These are not problems of our poverty. We are not in the 1930s. We are not in a depression. So we have options. And we have and the churches to find the solutions. Somebody, oh, yes sir, over here. That's actually a good segue. Uh, so my question is uh, sort of interested in, sorry, and how you might see uh, the push for a living wage play into this, uh, you know, struggle for getting affordable housing. Yes. Yeah. So that's uh, a, a core part of Jen's work, but I think overall the conversation about affordability, um, housing of course has taken over a lot of that, uh, that conversation in Vancouver. Um, but we, we can't look at it in isolation from things like living wage or child care, education costs, and all of those different things that add on to what affordability means for us, and also um, how we're being able to get that generational equity to get about proportional income to being able to afford housing and education and other costs. So I think that that's uh, a core part of the, of the conversation. Uh, yeah, I think the living wage discussion is uh, essential, and uh, especially for Vancouver. Uh, I know a lot of cities in Canada are facing issues of affordability, but I think in Vancouver, uh, it's the worst city in Canada for based on like your level of income. If you have a master's, you get paid the lowest on average or something like that. So we're not uh, we're doing more, and not necessarily getting recognized and um, rewarded for the effort that we're putting in. Uh, and so I think things like living wage policies are yeah, fundamental uh, to think about how, again, this discussion is not just about the cost of homes, it's about how much we're getting paid, it's about how much childcare costs, it's about how much transportation costs, it's about um, essential services that we need and how we couple that under the larger branch of affordability. So, yeah, definitely. Great point. Uh, I love that, and I think that as to your point, is we can look at housing and transportation separately, but we need to look at housing costs and transportation costs together. Um, but I would go one step further, and an idea that really excites me, excites me is this experiment around uh, like a basic kind of um, income, and, and there's a pilot that's already happening in Ontario looking at this 
Um, and the Cities of Color also to SMU Public Square because they're hosting a whole summit about the future of work. And I think that's really important to look at because as we look at the future and how things change, more and more jobs are being automated. I think there will need to be a decoupling of work and income. And I think we're already seeing that with the job speeds and I think it's a trend that isn't going to change. And so it's all these invisible jobs that are being lost because of automation. And so um, the leaders of Hootsuite, the leaders of big tech companies, and if they see the future, they see the implications and the ramifications of the research and of the technology that they're creating right now. And so I think it's really important that as we know that those technologies are going forward, we also put move in and create social security nets um, for us. Because I don't think that we need to be thinking and rethinking the way that work, what it means, and also how it's tied to income if we're going to be able to think about this long term. So I'm really excited for those conversations, those conversations that are going to have to be happening um, because I think it's vital not just for our generation but also the voices and the voices that are not yet doing work in this room but also in the world and the future that's coming. Okay, it's almost 9 o'clock. We have time for one short comment or question. Uh, somebody who hasn't... Uh, not Hey okay, guys, um, so my question was, uh, I, I think that things like this are great because what they really try to do is bring the question of development down to the social level on our poor, poor communities, whereas I feel oftentimes housing crises uh, are mediated by uh, international economic forces. I think what the, the question is that I would like to, to see included in a conversation like this is also looking at the social forces on an international level. So here we've got um, consideration of the social and economic at a community level, but I think that as we move forward, uh, without considering social pressures having to do with like diaspora, migration, etc., on that international level, and having that included in the community conversation and included in the considerations made by local people, that we're going to keep on running into problems that we weren't anticipating. So for you guys, who are the leaders and engaging this kind of stuff, I was wondering what your opinion is in including that in the conversation and having that as a point of consideration as we move forward. Um, I think that this ties really well back to the point that Ron was talking about as who do we engage as a man in these decisions? Right now, we're, we're um, talking about a neighborhood plan. We, we engage homeowners and we give flyers to everyone that lives in that neighborhood. Uh, but all, how about the people that are being displaced from around the world? How about refugees? How about immigrants that we know are coming in, and, and coming to Vancouver and coming to Canada as a refugee? The big picture and how things are going to change. Um, if you just think for the past 10 years, past 20 years, how much society and how much our world is transforming. Like how we how we can start planning for that and building into a resilient into the whole community so that as these shocks and climate change is hitting us, like how do we how can we actually um, shape our communities so that they're resilient and that they already have community capacity and right from the beginning. Okay. Uh, yeah. Just quickly, I think great point. It's it's hard for us to know what we don't yet know. Uh, but I think you know we're, we have technologies that uh, we can incorporate into the work that we're doing to kind of model for new things. Um, and I think just by bringing those diverse voices uh, into the discussion again, that we can start uh, thinking about uh, how our solutions are maybe a bit more inclusive uh, for the people who haven't historically been that way. Okay, it's nine o'clock. We have to stop. First of all, please join me in thanking our presenters.